whoa, I'm not seeing the results I want. Let's tweak it a little more. Let's do some of the things we talked about in Keto Clarity. Maybe you need to cut your carbs more. Maybe you thought 100 grams of carbs was right for you. Maybe 50 is right for you. So tinker and test and see how that does for you. And, and the same with the protein. And, and I think at the end of the day, let's don't think about it so much. If you're eating real food, you're nourishing your body. Even if it's not quite the right the right ratio for you with the macronutrients, I think we put too much emphasis on macronutrients, which is going to be a shock to a lot of people because I'm the low carb guy. I don't think macronutrients are as big a deal as we made them out to be. I think micronutrients uh, are bigger, and that's why I'm such a proponent for real food. I want people to eat real food first, and then from there, tweak and test to see where your macro should be. Hey folks, it's Mike Mutzer here with HighIntensityHealth.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to episode number 101. And today we're live with Jimmy Moore. He's the author of two best-selling books, Cholesterol Clarity and the book that I'm holding right here called Keto Clarity, which my wife and I went on a road trip recently and we we're reading it to each other back and forth. Great nuggets <laughs> in here. So we're going to talk to Jimmy and, and pick his brain on, on what's been this almost a year old, I think, Jimmy. You launched it last summer, is that right? It was last summer. In fact, we have a new one that's coming this summer called the Cajun Cookbook, a companion to that Keto Clarity. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the show, by the way. Hey, man. What's up, Mike? Doing good. Yeah, I learned a lot in your book. And, uh, you know, I think there's a couple of two fascinating stories that, that you talked about in the introduction, which I think would be beneficial for our listeners to kind of dive into. Sure. And you testified uh, to the uh, dietary guidelines, and, and I would love for you to kind of share what that experience was like. Yeah, so that was in the 2010 Dietary Guidelines, and I've been blogging since 2005 at that point, Mike, and I was like, you know what? These Dietary Guidelines, they never change. It seems like every five years, so they go every five years, so we had another one in 2015, which they're about to release the results of those soon, but in 2010, there was just the vibe of, oh, let's just keep things as they are, and I was like, no, the, I could sense that there was a momentum building for grain uh, re reduction and sugar reduction and just overall we're eating too much crap. Crappy right. garbage is killing us, as you know. And so I said, well, to my wife, Christine, I said, well, why don't we go to Washington, D.C. and I testify on Capitol Hill in front of this USDA Dietary Guidelines Committee. She said, you're nuts. They're not going to listen to you. Um, I said, well, I've got to give, you know, I've got to give a voice to the people that follow me and my work. Why don't we do this? Uh, I remember it because it was a really hot, like, July summer in Washington, D.C., 100 degrees or whatever it was. And we walked all these, you know, blocks to get there. But testifying before this committee was pretty awesome because observing the people that were around me. Now, mind you, we have 300 million people in the United States of America. How many people showed up to testify before this committee? 50. Wow. Not 500, not 5,000, 50. And so, okay, here we go. Uh, so I start hearing all these people testifying, and they were literally reading from scripts. I am from the sweet, uh, blah, 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 and this is why soy is good, it should be, and it's like, and then the next book, I am from the dairy, and this is why dairy, blah, 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 and I'm going, okay, is this what this is supposed to be about? Um, a little later on, I realized they were trying to get into the public record, and that's why they were reading. So I get up there as one of two, just two, uh, like, normal people. No offense to the people representing those companies, but they were paid to be there that day. I was not paid anything. I paid my own flight there and, and all the travel and hotel and everything. And I get up there and I just share from my heart. I'm like, look, I was a former morbidly obese man, and I tried all the things that you're talking about wanting to keep in these dietary guidelines for years and was frustrated and exacerbated and going, this does not work for me. So... I used to think there was something wrong with me, but I've realized there's something wrong with you guys pushing this crap on us, and I decided let's do the opposite of everything that you've ever said to do. So you said, cut your fat. I'm eating more fat. You said, eat more healthy whole grains. I don't eat any grains at all, or sugar, or starch. And I said, I'm going to come back here five years from now, and I'm going to look you right in the eye, and I'm going to say, why? 
because diabetes will be worse, obesity will be worse, heart disease will be much worse. All of these things have gotten worse in those five years since I testified. Now, Mike, as you know, nothing changed, but it was funny because one of the people that was there was uh, Dr. Jeff Fulick, um, who's a famous low-carb researcher, and he, he said, when you started talking, most of the time when other speakers were talking, they were just looking down, writing notes, doodling, whatever they were doing, they said, as soon as you started talking, because I don't remember it, I was just in a zone or something, and he said, as soon as you started talking, they all looked up and could not stop looking at you. Because I didn't read from notes, I was speaking from here. And you speak from here and you live and breathe this stuff, I, I think it comes across as quite authentic. And maybe some of the changes we've seen in the dietary guidelines this year, maybe, was a result of hearing to me in 2010. I, I can only hope. Yeah, me too. I can only hope. And, you know, what do you think it is? Do you think that uh, fat, you know, the notion that you eat more fat, you lose fat, do you think that people just have this perception that uh, this guilty by association that if you eat fat, you're going to get fat? I mean, or is there politics, money? It, you know, having been through this process and yeah. you know, interviewed 900 people, what do you think the issue is here? There's a lot of moving parts of this one, Mike. I, I think more than anything, though, it has to be the propaganda that's happened for decades. I mean, since since I was born, I don't know how old you are, I'm in my early 40s, but ever since I've been alive, fat has been vilified as an enemy in our health. It's the reason we have obesity. It's the reason we have heart disease. It's the reason... Ironically, we have diabetes. It has nothing to do with diabetes, but we can talk about that here in a minute. But I, I think just people have obediently listened to that fat has been the great enemy in their health. And now you try to switch that around. It's like trying to say Hitler was a good guy. <laughs> Seriously, can you physically in your brain make that happen, make that shift? You can't because there's such a negative imagery with him and saying with saturated fat. There's such this negative imagery. I almost wish we could change the name of saturated fat to something else. Just so we can create a positive imagery uh, with it, and, and I know um, some of my cohorts in the low carb community, um, you know, we've, we've said low carb, high fat, but some have shifted it to low carb, healthy fat, and so we're redefining what a healthy fat is. Butter is a healthy fat, and we can talk about all the reasons why it's a healthy fat. Coconut oil, same reason. Lard. Full fats, you know, I, I think getting people to see what positive benefits come from that um, is going to help them more than anything. But right now, I think the stigma is they've still bought into the propaganda and will be as long as people like Dean Ornish and John McDougall and T. Colin Campbell are all out there vilifying meat and, and by extension, saturated fat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so much confusion there. But when you look at the research, it's overwhelming. And so I was doing some PubMed searches and, you know, comparing ketogenic diets to low carb diets to, to low calorie diets, and they win yep. every time. And what's really fascinating to me, Jimmy, uh, you know, this whole anti aging movement, people are spending tons of money on hormones and growth hormone and, you know, injections and Botox and all this. But if you look mm -hmm. at the pathways that are amplified, in our metabolism, when we eat a high fat diet, it mirrors that of right. which, you know, is the anti-aging, you know, calorie restriction diet that, that is linked with, you know, suppression of the inflammatory response and reduced free radicals. And maybe you can kind of riff on that, why it's so beneficial to our metabolic machinery to eat a lot of fat. I think it goes back to blood sugar uh, and, and insulin by extension. Uh, I think a low blood sugar diet, when I say low blood sugar, I'm not talking about hypoglycemia. People will think that, oh, low blood sugar is bad. We've got to eat, uh, drink a glass of orange juice and eat a Snicker bar. No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I think having a steady, uh, steady state blood sugar is probably going to be more beneficial in an anti-aging perspective than anything else you could do. And if your blood sugar is steady state low, guess what? So is your insulin. So the, the thing that gets people into trouble is they start, again, listening to authorities, giving them advice, especially diabetics, listening to the American Diabetes Association. Oh, you need to have 60 grams of carbohydrate per meal for the three meals plus snacks. I mean, that right there is almost 200 grams of carbs just from the very organization who's trying to control diabetes, they're telling diabetics to do that. And then, oh, if your blood sugar goes up, oh, it means you're not taking enough insulin. So, you know, like I said, there's a lot of moving parts here. You've got pharmaceutical interest and the money that's flowing in through that. Um, and then you've got people that are still addicted to carbs that don't want to give them up. And then the fear of fat, all of these things kind of like melt together and create this mess that we're in. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's pretty scary. But, but from an anti-aging perspective, certainly keeping the, the insulin down, keeping the blood sugar under steady state control, which when you eat low carb, healthy fat, um, you easily do that. And you see my meals on Instagram, you know, I don't eat bad. Um, and that keeps your blood sugar under control. Absolutely. Yeah, it's fascinating. And just for people listening, if you're not convinced to eat a high fat diet, maybe this will, will let you, you know, convince you a little bit more, like just as you were saying, Jimmy, you know, when you eat fats, they're burned as fat and they create the ketones, which I'd love for you to understand. But when you eat carbs, they generally turn on fat uh, promoting pathways known as lipogenesis. And that's where people get the two confused. They think that carbs just go to store sugar. But uh, in a lot of people, particularly if you're insulin resistant, you amplify these fat forming pathways, lipogenesis. So it's really important. So maybe let's talk about, uh, you know, some tricks and hacks, you know, maybe an overview of what is ketosis and what's the best way to get in ketosis. Yeah. So people have heard the K word as we'll talk about it here. for many years, you know, uh, Dr. Atkins's diet was known as a, a, ke a ketogenic diet um, and you've heard the word ketosis ketones ketogenic from out there for many years uh, in keto clarity we tried to keep it real simple we, we didn't want to confuse people but the reality is most people walking around are sugar burners so if you're a sugar burner you're eating sugar as your fuel that's why they tell athletes go fuel up on carbohydrate and you'll, you'll fuel your body well that's true you can certainly fuel your body that way as an athlete or really anybody um, but the problem is you only have about 2,000 calories worth of sugar um, that you can burn at one time before you have to refuel. And people are like, okay, that's fine. What's the problem with that? Well, there's a better way. And nobody's talking about the better way. And the better way is shifting from sugar burner to fat burner. Well, how do you do that? Well, you got to eliminate the sources of sugar in your diet. And so what's the obvious first choice? Well, duh, sugar. Go eat sugar or at least minimize the impact of the sugar. Um, and then really all carbohydrates turn to sugar in the body. People don't realize that, Mike. They, they think, oh, uh, it's healthy whole grain, so those don't count. In fact, I was just at the farmer's market on Saturday. And, of course, there's a mix of good and bad at farmer's markets. So you've got to be very savvy when you're shopping there. But I was walking by, and this lady's like, you come here every Saturday. You never stop at my booth. I said, man, quite frankly, I only serve as carbs. It was like a granola and bread and all this stuff. Oh, well, you need to try my energy bar. My energy bar is all nuts and a little bit of honey. So I said, okay, I'll play cater. All right, I'll try your, your little energy bar. So I try it, and I said, can I see the ingredients? And she shows me, and I'm looking. The very first ingredient was oats. I'm like, ma'am, that is not a nut. That's a grain. Oh, I'm so sorry. The oats are good, right? I said, well, not for me. And I'm trying to eat lower carb and, and shift from sugar to fat burning. And I didn't get real technical with it, but... I think just people don't realize all the ways that they're getting sugar, carbs turning into sugar in the body. So you gotta minimize those. But the big one in keto clarity that has shocked a lot of people is overdoing it on protein. People just didn't realize you could actually make sugar in your body out of eating too much protein. Now, mind you, if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger and you're out there doing a lot of glycolytic uh, lifting and, and just exercising like a madman, yeah, please eat a lot of protein because you need to. But those of you who don't do that or are, are probably less inclined to exercise, you probably don't need as much protein as you think you do. So this is a low carb, moderated protein, high fat diet, because when you eliminate the carbs and you moderate the protein, the only thing left to eat is fat. Well, you're trying to be a fat burning machine. So it's the fat you're consuming plus the fat on your body, which remember while ago I told you it was 2000 calories worth of sugar and carbs. Guess how much you get from uh, fat and ketones. It's 40 plus thousand calories worth of energy right there at your disposal. That's why you're able to eat this way and go many hours without having to think about food. That's fantastic. And we can get into all the benefits of the ketones, particularly beta hydroxybutyrate, but I uh, want to, you know, kind of share with you my experience. I've been involved in fitness for 17 years and want to be a bodybuilder and all this sort of stuff. And when I, when I was 18, I worked at a gym, a gold's gym down in San Francisco. And um, what kind of scared me on the ketogenic diet, and that's why I hadn't, I do a high fat diet, but didn't really, you know, get into the whole 
ketosis measuring and so forth was some of the bodybuilders that would come in they'd be very lean but their breath would just stink so bad when they were check in you know at the front desk you could smell their breath and i'm like i'm never going to do that so i think <laughs> the misconceptions about like being in ketosis and what it really means but talk about why people get bad breath and how you can avoid that yeah, so uh, that's called halitosis, by the way. That's the medical term for it. And it's interesting, Dr. Atkins in his books talk, uh, addressed that directly. And he said, oh, actually, it's sweet breath. And that it's just kind of the production, uh, the byproduct of the ketones. Yeah, I mean, these are things that people squibble over. Well, you have bad breath, you, you run in those water really. I mean, they've gone over, and we've talked about all these in my book. I had a whole frequently asked questions right in the middle of it so that you could, you know, go to all those kinds of, it will destroy your thyroid. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, would you rather be healthy and have this, um, these things like bad breath which don't last, by the way. It's very, very uh, uh, temporary. If I had, uh, Christine, did I have bad breath when I started Atkins? You can check your head out. Yes or no? Oh, she's going, yeah. <laughs> but it does go away. Um, you just need to, uh, I mean, chew on some cinnamon bark. That'll help it go away. Just pop a, pop a mint. Just anything to deal with it in the short term because it's not really a long-term issue. And that's what a lot of these things like the halitosis, um, they're just very short-term. Um, and a big one they like that people do with is they have the muscle cramps and, and the fatigue feeling and all this, especially when they very first start. And that is a real issue because you're not doing the things that you need to do to mitigate that. And we talk about this in Keto Clarity that you got to drink a lot of water. So if you don't drink water, you know, you're flushing a lot of water early on because keep in mind your sugar stores, uh, they're called, um, um, glycogen in your muscles, those are being dumped. Well, guess what else is in the glycogen stores? It's water. So you're peeing out a whole lot of water early on when you start ketosis. So you've got to replenish that with plenty more water. So don't fear drinking water. And then the other thing you shouldn't fear, and it's just as bad as saturated fat, is the salt. Because people lose a lot of sodium early on, you've got to replenish that sodium. And then there's two other uh, micronutrients. You've got uh, magnesium you need to take. I used to take a little bit of magnesium before bedtime, but you sleep anyway. But you got to get magnesium in. And then potassium, which people think, oh, you need to eat a banana. No, a banana has 29 grams of sugar. You really don't want to do that. But here's the, and it's got great potassium in it. But here's the truth. You get twice as amount uh, of potassium in uh, an avocado as you do a banana. And so eat an avocado and so you get all those things and what do all those do they normalize your electrolytes and when your electrolytes are normalized you don't start getting the fatigue you don't have the leg cramps you don't have all the keto flu that they talk about early on and that's something that a lot of people they avoid starting this because they're like well i don't want to go through all that well number one it's very temporary i think i had those symptoms for like a week uh, when I first started at 400 plus pounds, um, I, I don't get them anymore because now I drink plenty of water and I, I get plenty of salt in my food and, and do all the things that I know can, can stave it off. Mm, that's fantastic. So um, I would like to talk about some of the benefits and then we'll kind of get into uh, some of the hacks and tricks there, but uh, just to kind of hook people in, if they're not totally convinced that they should do this, uh, the research is astounding. Again, you do a great job in Keto Clarity going through that, but maybe talk about some of the, everyone wants more energy. Uh, eating takes a lot of time. So if we can eat less, we can focus more on our life's work and with our family. And then I think the neurological benefits are so profound. Everyone wants a better memory, more focus. So maybe if we could tackle some of those issues to kind of let people know about all these benefits of the keto bodies. Oh my gosh. And this was kind of the cool thing in researching this. I, I, I've been living and breathing this for over a decade now. And even I learned a lot of the research that was out there that I, I had no idea. Um, and in the back of Keto Clarity, we had 188 plus references to studies. So if, yeah, I, I'm telling you, don't believe what I wrote. And my co-author is a very respected low-carb researcher himself, Dr. Eric Westman. Don't believe him. Don't believe any of the 22 experts that are my moment of clarity quote experts throughout the book. Don't believe any of us. Go read the scientific literature. Now, I'll help you interpret it in my book. I try to make it real easy layman's language. I'm, I'm a, a layman, so I want to interpret it in that way for people to understand. And, and that's been another gratifying thing about that book is 
we wrote it in such a way that even the average person goes, oh, that's what that means, rather than oh, beta hydroxybutyrate, like what? Just blows people's minds. And I, and I think that's kind of my mission is to try to translate this stuff for average people um, to understand it. Because Mike, you know, we can sit here and geek out on this stuff all day and we'd love it, but we're missing 99% of the population when we do that. So, what are some of the benefits? I mean, your brain thrives on fat and ketones. And that's something you're not being told. We're being told, oh, you've got to feed your brain sugar and carbs so it will function properly. Again, if you're a sugar burner, that's exactly right. But there's an alternative way, and I would dare say and argue a better way to make your brain function the way it's supposed to. Now, we're called fat heads for a reason, because uh, was it 70% of the brain is fat? That shocks people too. And so if you're not feeding your body fat, and when I say fat, I mean real fats, like saturated fats from real food sources, butter, uh, full fat meats and cheeses, lard, any of those really good fats, not the seed oil fats, the vegetable oils that you see lined up at the grocery store like a mile long, corn oil, mazola, all that kind of crap, um, soybean oil, even the cherished canola oil, no, it's not healthy either. Um, you've got to feed your body the right kinds of fats. And it goes to this word we talked about in my previous book, cholesterol clarity. It goes to inflammation because if you're inflaming your body, you're not a healthy body. And so you want to keep inflammation down. Hmm, what are the two things that are making inflammation bad? Oh, yeah, vegetable oils and carbohydrates. And when I say carbohydrates, I mean the crappy kind, not green leafy vegetables, non-starchy vegetables, and even uh, the little bit of carbs that would be in some of the low sugar fruits. Those are perfectly fine. I'm referring to the whole grains that have been pulverized and made into this powder, and we eat them as cookies and cakes and muffins and bagels and all this kind of stuff, and same with sugar. Um, that's just not natural. That's not the way God intended for us to eat food. So uh, just eat real food, you might have heard as a mantra, totally is true, and the whole we can eat that food, the better. Okay, that's my rant. Rant's over. <laughs> but all the benefits uh, to your brain, you have clear thinking, you have mood stability. You know, we've been hearing about all these crazy people shooting, you know, schools and all that. It, it makes me wonder, Mike, and I've said this, you know, publicly, I wonder how many of those people have a crappy diet. And if they just were eating correctly, would they need those antipsychotic drugs that they're taking? I don't know. I, I would love to see a study done on that, taking these people on these antipsychotic drugs to get them on a high-fat, low-carb diet, and to see if they would get the same or better benefits without the drug. Mm. Let's see that happen. So brain health, just amazing. Now energy, you have, uh, I'm so glad that you're doing it. Uh, but energy is just comes out the wazoo when you eat this way. And you have just such, um, it, it just, for, uh, I, there's so many things. I mean, I could go on and on forever about all the benefits. Uh, you know, people worry about their you know, heart health and that kind of thing. Their cholesterol is too high, blah, blah, blah. Actually, all the relevant cholesterol markers get, better. Triglycerides drop, HDL goes up, um, the inflammation, which we talked about earlier, uh, in, measured in CRP, C-reactive protein, actually comes down to a really good level. Um, my current CRP is 0.4, and anything under 1.0 is what you want. Um, triglycerides under 100 is really good. Mine are in the 50s. Um, HDL cholesterol needs to be uh, definitely over 50 and ideally above 70. Mine's like 75 or 80 right now. So, I mean, all of these things that your doctor, quite frankly, doesn't know, improves on this diet. And he'll look at total cholesterol and LDL and would say, oh, you have a statin drug deficiency. Here's a prescription. And no, I, I sometimes feel like that we're living a twilight zone world where the doctors don't really understand all the latest science. They're living in 1960s, 1970s America, still doing things the way we did then. And they've moved on, and there's a lot of research that has come out since then that is pretty much they've been left behind because they haven't kept up with it. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. I've worked with doctors for the past 10 years in the functional medicine industry and even very, you know, prestigious doctors, you know, you you get kind of intimidated, like going to meet with them and talk to them about nutrition. And then afterwards you're like, oh my gosh, they're still thinking about, you know, blood sugar in this one dimensional model and and not, you know, ignoring the gut microbiome and not talking about ketosis and stuff. But, you know, just to, to convince people further that they should try this ketogenic diet, uh, the main ketone body, beta hydroxybutyrate. I was doing some research on it over the weekend, so I could kind of, you know, get up to speed. And, and it's an intracellular signaling molecule for our genes and this whole notion of epigenetics that mm-hmm. our, our environment influences the way that our genes are read. Beta hydroxybutyrate does a great job at influencing the epigenome in a beneficial way, preventing cancer, enhancing neurologic plasticity. I mean, the research goes on and on. I was blown away. I was, you know, had my uh, my iPad in the car, and Deanna was like, "Well, tell me the study. Tell me." I was like, right. <laughs> No, it's, a, it's really fascinating. I think everyone should should at least try this and see how they feel. And there's certainly no harm. You know, people are like, oh, it's dangerous to try a ketogenic diet. I'm like, guys, it's real food. Where's the danger in eating real food? And yet nobody bats an eye at all those drugs. I mean, I know people, and my brother Kevin, right before he died at the age of 41, he was taking 27 drugs at one time. Now, he had to a lot of those because he'd had heart attacks and diabetes and morbid obesity and all the things that come with that. Um, but there's a lot of people that take drugs, and they don't think twice about that. But then you bring up the K word again, and they're like, oh, my gosh, why would you do that? I've heard so many negative things. It's going to make your heart explode. And it's like, real food's going to do all that? Really? <laughs> really? Right. Yeah, that's that's fascinating stuff. And and uh, furthermore, a lot of people on the show, Jimmy, love the gut, and we talk about the gut a lot. And we yeah. talk about butyrate, how beneficial butyrate is. And one of the main ketone bodies is just hydroxylated butyrate. So you basically yeah. split water, add it on to butyrate, butyric acid made by healthy bifida bacteria, and you have the main ketone body that does all this beneficial stuff. And we know all the research on butyrate is so beneficial for preventing colon cancer, reducing inflammation, and so forth. So fascinating stuff there. So it's not like this, you know, these ketones are not like scary. They're not toxic. Like you're saying. They're naturally produced right. in our body by our gut microbiome. And um, quite frankly, everybody makes ketones at some point. Even the vegans that eat 30 bananas a day, in an overnight fast, they are waking up with extremely low levels, but they do have levels of ketones, beta hydroxybutyrate, in their blood at that point. And any time that you skip a meal, on accident or on purpose or anytime that you've fasted if you're a religious person you go on a, a three-day fast guess what you're surviving because of beta hydroxybutyrate if you didn't have those ketone bodies stepping in your body would probably start shutting down yeah because it would think oh, we're in starvation mode oh my gosh we have no backup mechanism but yes you do uh to keep us alive uh, you know, and you hear about these survivalist stories of people being you know, in, in a plane crash and they survive and until so people can get to them, they kind of survive the way they survived was ketones. And, you know, I think about our, our hunter gatherer ancestors, you know, they went long periods of time, sometime between kills. And when they had an animal kill, they were keeping the ketones up because guess what? They were eating the fattiest parts of that animal. They go through the brain first because that's where most of the fat was. Hmm, only a 70% fat's up there. And, and they would eat that first. And then during the periods of fasting, they would keep the ketosis going. And the ketones kept them energized. That's actually um, you know, something that the Inuit uh, tribes have, have seen happen as well. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's just cool, you know, that the, this information is out there. I've written now two books about the ketosis, and people are interested in this, Mike, and I, I'm really glad that we're on today talking about this because not enough in the mainstream, though, are listening. I mean, I've, I've interviewed anybody and everybody on my podcast about this, this topic, but still it's not in the mainstream. It's getting there. I, I don't think they can ignore it much longer. But it's getting there. But right now, you have to really do a lot of research to learn about this. Yeah. And then get excited about all the benefits and, and realize. Oh, that. yeah. And experience it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like you guys are. Yeah. I mean, the mental clarity thing to me was was the biggest, you know, yeah. for sure. Um, so it's fascinating stuff. So you talk about the gut microbiome. You know, everyone's talking about how food interacts with the gut microbiome. You, uh, in your book, I think you highlight a 2014 study that showed that a ketogenic diet does not interfere with gut microbiota production and so forth. Uh, any developments or any you know words of wisdom after interviewing 900 experts that you want to share? 
Yeah, one of the experts in keto clarity was Dr. Terry Walls, um, who's well known uh, for uh, overcoming her MS with a ketogenic paleo diet. So kind of what we've been talking about here today, a real foods-based ketogenic diet. And one of her concerns was a ketogenic diet and vegetable intake. And so uh, she wanted to make sure we got plenty of the vegetables. And one of the things that came up during that discussion of me talking to her, uh, I brought up gut health. And I said, you know, how do you get the adequate amount of uh, gut bacteria fed with a ketogenic diet? Because you can't have the safe starches that we hear about. You, I don't think a uh, caveman ate until the starch straight out of a spoon. You know, how are we feeding that? Can you feed it with, you know, low carb vegetables and shit. Absolutely. Just make sure you get plenty of green leafy vegetables and plenty of the non-starchy vegetables um, because you're looking for the fiber. The fiber is what's feeding the gut uh, flora. And if you're consuming these green leafy and non-starchy vegetables, you're getting quite a bit of fiber from those things. I don't know. Have you ever been flatulent after having broccoli? Yeah. Of course. And so that is actually the gut bacteria being fed. So I think it's kind of a misnomer to say, well, if you eat a ketogenic diet, you're not able to take care of your gut health. Um, I think the question still remains. That hasn't been answered by science yet. And I want to see those studies done. I know there's several active studies out there, but you might hear things on the internet that say, oh, low carb diet, very low carb ketogenic diet does this and this and this to your gut health. If somebody's saying that verifiably, emphatically, uh, you need to run because they aren't really quoting any kind of science that's out there that's proven this. So, yeah, I think the ketogenic diet, until we get more research, Mike, um, all the weeping and gnashing of teeth about how dangerous it is for the gut, I, I just don't think we have enough information to say that verifiably. And so if anybody does say that so strongly and boldly, um, I would question them to share the science that they're looking at because I think we're all trying to be scientists and amateur scientists, you know, trying to learn this stuff. And if people are making bold statements without backing it up with some sort of research, we need to question their validity in the community uh, making such assertions. It's okay to have opinions. Oh, I think a very low carb ketogenic diet could, that's the word, could be harmful to gut bacteria. But until we know for sure, um, through science and, and repeat, repeated science. I think we need to see quite a few studies that show that there's harm being done. Um, until that happens, I don't believe it and yeah. won't believe it. And, and I think with anything, not just gut health and low-carb diets, uh, really anything, always question it. You know, I would hope, Mike, that they're listening to you and your podcast and watching on this video and they'd say, all right, he's a good-looking dude, but um, that doesn't mean he knows everything and everything they're saying coming out of his mouth is going to be true. And I think you'd agree with that, Absolutely. that please question you. And I, I do the same thing on my show. Please question. If you hear something on my show you don't agree with, go do your research on it and see and let it pass your own BS test. Yeah, I would agree 100% and I encourage people to do that. I myself wrote a book as well and it's all the references are there. And I said, just as you did uh, earlier, Jimmy, so eloquently is don't believe me, uh, go to the source and read the references that I use to put this in together. And if there are right. problems or you have you know qualms with it, then drop me an email or a chat about it. But, you know, I think with, when it comes back to, you know, kind of conclude here on the gut microbiome and then move on to different hacks and tricks, um, you, you hit on it, uh, you know, avoid all the processed and refined uh, oil the so safflower, canola, and so forth, because those are used in clinical studies, at least in animals, to cause perturbations in the gut microbiome. So when you get to these, you know, uh, we eat the whole animal dry fats, you know, grass-fed butter and so forth, uh, those haven't always been shown to be deleterious to the gut microbiome, but for sure the processed oils are. And then again, like you said with Terry Walls, you want to focus on the vegetables. Those are the polyphenols and all the, the fiber in the vegetables are, are beneficial uh, to the gut microbiome. But the question there, I guess, would be, at, you know, what sort of um, good vegetables don't um, kick you out of ketosis? Like what vegetables should you focus on? And this is going to be a point of contention with some people um, because not everybody can have all the vegetables that they want. They're not a freebie. And same with fruit. And, and sometimes you'll hear, oh, make sure you eat fruits and vegetables. You know, I hear people, I just was watching a YouTube video a while ago of, of some show that was talking about diet and, and what to eat. And, oh, it just all comes down to eating lots of fruits and vegetables, as if the two are the same. Let's cut those in half. Okay, fruits are one category, vegetables another. So let's handle the fruits real quick because 
Most fruits are probably too sugary for people with metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, morbid obesity, or some history of those things. So when it comes to fruit, um, in Keto Clarity, we call that fruit is nature's candy. In fact, my co-author, Dr. Westman, has that on his patient wall. Fruit is nature's candy. And they walk in and go, what kind of wackadoodle doctor is this? You know, but, but he's right because those things, yes, they're natural. Yes, they're sweet from God. But that doesn't mean your body understands the difference between 29 grams of sugar in a banana and 29 grams of sugar in a Coca-Cola. Okay, sure, you get a few micronutrients that you wouldn't get from the Coca-Cola in the banana, but you're getting a whole lot of starch and sugar. And so I don't think people view food in those terms. So fruit you have to be careful with. I have blackberries, blueberries, and strawberries from time to time. In fact, I just bought some at the farmer's market in my refrigerator over there. Um, I'm eyeing them now. Uh, but you can have a few of those if you're super metabolically resistant or if you're an exerciser um, and, and doing that real intense and you want a good post-workout, that with a protein and fat like almond butter with it would just be amazing. Um, and, and they're okay. So let's get back to the, the vegetable part. I think vegetables um, are a great thing. Green leafy vegetables for everybody. I put kale and spinach in just about everything that I cook um, because it's so nutrient dense, so incredible for you too. Then you have things like broccoli and cauliflower and squash and zucchini and onions and tomatoes, depending on your nightshade uh, uh, preference there. Um, some people can't have nightshade, some people can. Um, you know, and then from there, if you're able to tolerate all those, and when I say tolerate, you're able to see it on a blood sugar monitor and blood ketone monitor for that matter. So you might be like, okay, let's try something like a half of a sweet potato and see how I do. And some people do that, Mike, and they realize, I can't do that. It, my blood sugar went through the roof. I lost all my ketones. Then you know your tolerance level to carbohydrates. I'm in that category. I can't even have, like, I can't even look at a sweet potato because my blood sugar will go up. But there's other people, my wife Christine, can have a whole sweet potato and she'll still be in ketosis. I'm going, how did you do that? <laughs> but it just shows the individuality of all of this that one person's diet doesn't necessarily translate to everybody. You've got to tinker and test and find what works for you. And as a former 410-pound person, I am okay with that. I know I can have only limited amounts of carbohydrates, and I have to do that. Uh, I often joke people in interviews, I've had all the carbs I've been allowed to have my entire life, the first 32 years of my life. Okay, maybe that's not true, but there's a little element of truth in there because it is impacting me at the age of 43 now that I can't have um, even real food-based carbs like I would have, but for the damage that's happened. Mm -hmm. That's great. So basically it comes down to everyone's really unique and individual, and that's why you got to do a little trial and error. Um, that's right. And speaking of the trial and error, you've worked with so many different people. Um, have you found that the timing of the carbohydrates, you mentioned athletes and maybe having some higher uh, sugar carbohydrates, maybe like a strawberry with some almond butter after working out. Yep. Anything on meal timing before and after exercise at night? carbs versus uh, morning everybody that has an opinion in the health community will tell you different things and so I won't even try to regurgitate any of that um, I just know for me and I'm just speaking for, for me and and a lot of the people that I've interviewed kind of uh, reciprocate this Mike but eat when you're hungry drink when you're thirsty and let's stop worrying about timing you know I, I do a show on Fridays called low carb conversations with this dietitian and Cassie and one of the uh, topics that we talked about recently was timing your coffee just right in the morning so you get the biggest bang for your buck with the caffeine and so th they've determined through science that you should wait an hour after you wake up before you have that first cup of coffee because it helps maximize the impact of the caffeine okay if we have to get that anal retentive about when we eat and when we drink coffee and when we, I just think that's too much dieting mode for me. I listen to my body. I eat when I'm hungry and when I'm not hungry anymore, I stop eating. And when I get hungry again, oh yeah, I eat again. But it's not this constant thinking about, you know, I used to, in my former 400 pound days, I used to have breakfast and think about what I'm going to have for my mid-morning uh, snack. And then the snack, I what do I have for uh, lunch today? You know, it's constantly thinking about food. Now, Mike, I don't even hardly think about food until it's time to make that meal in there. And, and then I think about it a lot because it's 
beautiful when it's done, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, Jimmy, you're a creative entrepreneur. You know, you, you try to do different things. You experiment. A lot of people are very obedient and they just want to have a script on what to do. Yeah. So I think it's challenging. So maybe from a mindset perspective, any, yeah. any tips or tricks to help people just get out of this one track mindset and realize that there is no one right diet. They got to try it on and see if it fits. Yeah, one of the things that people often write to me, I, I get hundreds of emails a day that and it's hard to keep up sometimes, but one of the, the major ones that comes in, well, what's the macronutrient ratio I should be eating of carbs and fat and protein? And I'm like, you know, it's not about that. And we hit that pretty hard in Keto Clarity. It's not about macronutrient ratios. I mean, Christine's is somewhere around 55% fat, about 30% protein, the rest carbs, whereas me, it's around 80% fat, 15% uh, protein, and the rest carbs. And so it's radically different from person to person. And I think if you realize, oh, I need a starting point, I would just say just start doing something. Because it, at that point, then you have a baseline. Whoa, I'm not seeing the results I want. Let's tweak it a little more. Let's do some of the things we talked about in Keto Clarity. Maybe you need to cut your carbs more. Maybe you thought 100 grams of carbs was right for you. Maybe 50 is right for you. So tinker and test and see how that does for you. And, and the same with the protein. And, and I think at the end of the day, let's don't think about it so much. If you're eating real food, you're nourishing your body. Even if it's not quite the right the right ratio for you with the macronutrients, I think we put too much emphasis on macronutrients, which is going to be a shock to a lot of people because I'm the low carb guy. I don't think macronutrients are as big a deal as we've made them out to be. I think micronutrients uh, are bigger, and that's why I'm such a proponent for real food. I want people to eat real food first, and then. From there, tweak and test to see where your macro should be. But the real food aspect is the first and foremost. Stop eating Atkins bars thinking you're doing something good because it says low carb and two gram net effective carbs or whatever marketing crap they put on there. It's junk. Stop eating junk. Eat real food and t tinker and test. I, I think people fall into the mindset, Mike, of dieting when they start something like this. That's why they want rules. That's why they want macronutrient ratios. And I think it's time that if we try back to real food and we tinker and test, we're going to find the results that we've been looking for, that we've been failing at, at finding for so many years. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said, Jimmy. I love that approach. And um, we have a couple of final questions here. And one of them was was on your favorite micronutrient herb or botanical. And that, I usually ask that one second, but I'll ask it now because you, you highlighted that you really like the micronutrient. So if you could uh, just take one micronutrient, maybe in a supplement or a whole food, uh, what would that be for the rest of your life? You could only have one. What would it be? Vitamin D, without a doubt. And, and I would add with K because it's not as effective if you don't have the vitamin K with it. Um, and I only say that because there's just so much research. And please go do research. I did a whole podcast about it with this guy named Dr. Michael Hollick recently uh, re-aired it. It was an old, old episode, but it had such gold mine in there. Go listen to that, H-O-L-I-C-K. Um, but he uh, is basically the man when it comes to vitamin D. And there are so many benefits. And I would even give the flip side. There's so many detriments to not having an adequate level in the blood. And you might be like, well, I stay out in the sun plenty of times, um, and I, I get uh, the, micro, the uh, vitamin D in milk, and I, that should be good, right? Well, guess what? They put about 400 uh, IU of vitamin D in your milk. Um, by the way, don't drink milk because milk can have a lot of lactate, and we can get into that, the sugar and blah, blah, blah. But that's not near enough. I have to take about five to 10,000 a day IU of vitamin D and I get outside and, and get sun too. I'm one of those people that doesn't absorb it very well, obviously, and doesn't utilize it well. So I have to take vitamin D. So yeah, that would be one that if I was stranded on a deserted island, I want a lifetime supply of vitamin D with K in it because it's going to keep me healthy. Um, and I think people forget about micronutrition um, and the importance of it. It's lost in the calories discussion. It's lost even in the carbs, fat, protein discussion. you got to have certain micronutrients. And I've even had a personal story lately where my iron levels went way too low. And whereas just two years ago, I was told I was borderline hemochromatosis 
too high in iron, so I did all these things obediently. I cut down on red meat to once or twice a week rather than every day. Um, I cut down on the green, uh, some of the green leafy vegetables that had iron in it. I didn't take an iron supplement. I would go and give blood every two months, and that totally depleted me of my iron stores almost to the, well, to the point that I was uh, iron deficient anemic. Wow. So I've been able to turn that around now, uh, eating red meat and, and doing all the opposite thing, not giving blood anymore. But it just goes to show you that's how important all of this is with the micronutrition. You've got to keep an eye on it and you've got to do prudent things. I thought I was doing a prudent thing, trying to get rid of too much iron, but you can go in the opposite direction, so be careful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great advice there. And uh, for people listening that live in the southern part of the U.S., maybe Arizona, Colorado, Southern Cal, Florida, uh, that doesn't mean you're exempt from vitamin D. I mean, no. uh, we there's a study came out, University of Arizona in Tucson showed that uh, over 70% of the subjects were vitamin D deficient. And we all know how much sun Arizona gets. And I worked at a clinic in Colorado and, and we tested, did a clinical study with the fire department there. And as you may know, uh, Jimmy and, and others listening, that firemen generally have other jobs or outside their hiking, they're biking on their days off the work, like, you know, 48 hours on and four days off. So they get a lot of uh, time out outdoors and Colorado has 300 sunny days a year. And uh, they were 80% of them were vitamin D deficient. So yep. severely deficient. So very uh, important point there. So thanks for sharing that. So uh, the second question here, Jimmy, is we know that you're a bestselling author. You have a new cookbook out. You've interviewed, you know, close to a thousand experts and, and have multiple podcasts and a great blog. What's your morning routine? We know mornings are very uh, productive and can be uh, successful people have morning routine. So share with us, if you would, in a few minutes, what your morning looks like. <laughs> what is a day in the life of Jimmy Moore? Welcome to Boring Land. So, uh, yeah, I um, I get up in the morning and I, I, I'm not a coffee drinker. You know, people are like, oh, I drink Bulletproof coffee in the morning. I'm like, I hate the taste of coffee. I even told Dave Asprey that, the guy that made yeah. the Bulletproof coffee. And I said, dude, I hate coffee. So you really like mine. It doesn't have the mycotoxins in it. I'm like, mycotoxins, mycotoxins. I don't like coffee. And he said, oh, I'll send you some. So he sent me some. I tried it, and it was gross. And no offense to Dave Asprey. I just don't like coffee. So I don't drink coffee. I actually grab a bottle. Let me see if I can head over. I'll be right back. Kombucha. I thought I was close enough to grab it real quick. Sorry about that. But I like I like kombucha, uh, this kombucha soda. I used to drink diet soda back in my 400 – Plus pound days, I uh, drank 16 cans of sugary soda a day. Wow. Yes, that's bad. Don't do that, people. Um, so when I switched over to a low-carb diet, the Atkins diet in 2004, I switched to diet soda. And I was drinking upwards of, you know, six, eight, ten of those a day for a long time. And, you know, I've been doing this a little while, but that diet soda thing was hard to shake. So uh, I grabbed this kombucha soda here. They're not a sponsor or anything. I just I just love the product. I drive all the way to the next town to find it and the whole paycheck. I mean Whole Foods. Um because it's that good. So I'll grab that and I'll sit down and I'll just pull out my iPad and go through the emails because I do get hundreds of them a day um, and try to sift through those. If anything I can answer quick, I'll do that real quick. And uh, any that need a little more attention, I just leave them in there for now. And then I take a shower, come back out, start preparing for any interviews that I have that day, which uh, three, four, four days a week I do podcasts, so I'm always interviewing somebody sometime, or being on other people's shows like today. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the routine, and then just going through um, just the work, you know, going, checking my social media pages, going to Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and all that, and I personally do that. People are like, is this the real Jimmy Moore? I'm like, who else would it be? That's me. <laughs> Um, and then I like to go out into stores and sometimes take pictures of, of things that claim to be healthy and aren't so healthy and post that on, on Instagram and Twitter. And I just like to engage my audience. And I think um, it's a concerted effort. And, and truth be told, I did that too much, Mike. And I've had to learn to back away. I am a, a natural hard worker where I just feel like I got to go, 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 go all the time. And, you know, people like Dan, Diane Sanfilippo and Sean Croxton and other friends of mine all said, dude, back away from the microphone and nobody gets hurt. And they were right. I mean, this was like a couple of years ago they told me this. And I have slowly tried to learn to do more uh, staycations where I just kind of unplug. Um, my wife and I just got back from a trip last week to up to the mountains in North Carolina just to do nothing, you know, and I think those kinds of things are so healthy for you. 
um, mentally, physically, spiritually, you know, you really need to take care of you. And especially when you're in the health industry, um, it, I think some of us are so passionate about the message that we want to work, 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 work. Oh, by the way, we're losing our health in the process of doing that to try to help you in your health. There's something wrong with this picture. So um, that, that's some of the things that I've had to had to learn to do is just not be so in a routine. So when you ask what my morning routine is, I'm like, well, I try to mix it up a little bit. But what I what I shared was uh, kind of in general what I do. I like it. And then I go make a meal for my wife when she wakes up. Um, you know, I like cooking for her. I love it, Jimmy. Thanks for going into all that detail. And I think one of the reasons that you're so successful in the book world and in your podcast are so popular is you're really engaging. A lot of people that that have the same clout that you have and the the exposure. I don't, don't, there's no reciprocity. It's kind of a one main message, but with you, you're very engaging. I think that's really important. So uh, thank, thank you. you. For doing that. Thank you. So the final question here, Jimmy, something we ask every guest on the show before we part ways is if you were to bump shoulders with Barack Obama or a future president, you could bend their ear for 30 seconds about one lifestyle or health tip, and maybe they could eventually form policy around, but most importantly, you'd want them to share it with Americans uh, and the rest of the world. What would that health tip be and why? Honestly, I don't think any politician is going to change nutritional health policy, so I would never try to convince Barack Obama or any president or any congressman or senator for that matter. I think it's going to happen because of people like you and me. And that's, and, and that's why we do these shows, because we know someday when people get fed up from being sick and tired of being sick and tired, um, they're going to find your podcast. They're going to find my podcast. They're going to read Keto Clarity and Cholesterol Clarity and all these books that are out there that are changing people's lives. Um, so if I had their ear, I would just say, can you please just give credence to this message? You know, say that it's an, a great alternative for the low-fat diet if it didn't work for you. Maybe a low-carb diet can help. If it didn't work for you, maybe a paleo diet can work. I think we've grown so accustomed to the government telling us it's just one way. This is the way. And now the, the kind of darling of the community is the Mediterranean diet, which the Mediterranean diet has some great principles, but it's not the be-all and all either. Let's give people options and encourage our leaders to speak out and say, look, if something's not working, try something else. I think that's what our message has been uh, for a long time is just give people the right to find what works for them. Yeah. Beautifully said. Great, Jimmy. So you have a new cookbook coming out, a couple of podcasts, maybe if you could share with our listeners before you part ways where they can learn more about that. Yeah. So, um, I'm probably most famous for that podcast. Um, the live in La Vida low carb show airs Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday on iTunes, the live in low carb show.com. And yeah, we're coming up on episode 1000 in August. So, uh, unprecedented in podcasting that not many people have hit four digits in podcasting, but, uh, in the health podcasting, for sure, it's, it's unprecedented. Not, not even Jillian Michaels is close to that. So well, am I one Oh one on your show? Is that what you said at the beginning? Uh, well, you're yeah, you're uh, yeah. Let's see. One Oh one. Yes. Yeah. So I started in August, <laughs> ah, well, wow. You're bad. That's awesome, man. You have been a madman. So, um, so that's the podcast, and then uh, I have a blog as well. I've, actually, the blog's been out a lot longer. Um, it's at uh, livinglevitalowcarb.com slash blog. It's called the Living Levita Low Carb blog. And then on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all the social media sites, I'm uh, at Living Low Carb Man. And then Friday's podcast is Low Carb Conversations with Jimmy Moore, Dietitian, Cassie and Friends, which you guys are going to be on here real soon. And that's lowcarbconversations.com. And then the, the books that you mentioned, uh, Cholesterol Clarity came out in 2013, uh, cholesterolclarity.com, Keto Clarity came out last year in 2014, ketoclarity.com. And then this is our new baby. Me and Maria Emmerich uh, wrote this book, The Ketogenic Cookbook just came in the mail Friday. So I'm, I'm like, I'm like sleeping with it right now. <laughs> and uh, we don't have a website for it, but you can find it on Amazon and get it wherever books are sold. It comes out July the 28th. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll write you a nice review, Jimmy. So thanks again. Oh, thank you. Love, yeah, man. Love your messages, love your books and, and everything that you're doing. So for those of you that are listening and you're driving or walking your dog and you want to check out the show notes that we take for you and learn more about Jimmy, all those websites he references, his social media channels and all his books, you can visit highintensityhealth.com slash Jimmy. I'll post all those there as well as the video version of this interview. So thanks again for tuning in and Jimmy, hope you have a great day. Thank you, Mike.